can you feel that tension? Well, you will when we fit the drive belt. <laughs> Today we are going to fit the motor cage sub-assembly to the car and set up the drivetrain as shown on page 16 of the build manual. You'll need your spanners and allen keys for this build. Get your motor cage into position and I'll let Steve take it from here. So now we're about to fix our motor cage onto our car. We assembled this earlier of course. Um, to facilitate that though, what I've done first of all, when we fitted this cover plate here when we're doing the back axle, I tightened up these two back axle mounting bolts. So now I've slackened those off, so you can see this moves quite easily. And I'm gonna take, first of all, the fixings for here. So looking down through the hole, moving things around until they're aligned, means I can hopefully get that screw to start threading into there. There we go, just get it in a little way. And then it's the other one. Just jiggle things around if it's not going to go in first time and it should line up there we go I've got that one now and then from there we can start going around fitting the other fixings that the smaller bolts on the outer holes have captive nuts already fitted to the chassis so with our washer on the bolt I can just screw that one into there it's matching one on the other side the larger bolts with their washers can then go down through the holes. And then I've got my washer and nut, which I'll do up gently. Got another one here. And then we repeat that process at the front. So having got our motor cage fitted uh, loosely, what we need to do is go around and tighten up all the fastenings now. So there's a few of these to do. Easy to forget is that we slackened off these two axle mounting bolts to allow us to get the top part of this plate fitted. So we must come back and tighten those up. Now we have our motor cage all tightened up, the next step is actually to attach the drive belt to both the motor and the rear axle. To do that, we need the motor set in its position so that the belt will be at its slackest point. And that's done by moving the motor and its mount all the way to the forward of the, to the front of the motor cage. So to do that, we need to actually slacken off these bolts. Don't slacken it off to the point where it comes undone you know, falls off because then it'd be really difficult to get it back on with the motor cage in place. And I can now slide the motor and its mount backwards and forwards. So we slide it all the way to the forwards position and then reach down under the car and get the belt onto the motor sprocket. And if you just get one edge on and then rotate the motor, being careful, really careful not to get fingers trapped you can walk the belt onto the sprocket and then the same with the axle sprocket we get one edge on there and if I then rotate that it will actually walk its way on. Hello me again so why do we use gears well why don't we just attach the motor directly to the wheel well by using gears we can take the input rotation from the motor and alter it, either increasing or decreasing the speed and torque of the output. To help me demonstrate, I've built this little mock-up of the gear setup on the car. Little gear connected to a big gear which drives the wheel. Now, I'm going to act as the motor and when I spin the little gear, do you think the big gear will go quicker or slower? Let's spin it to find out. You should see the big gear rotates slower than the little gear. That's because the big gear has a larger circumference. If we were to roll the gears along the desk, you'll see that the big gear will travel further than the little gear in one rotation. The distance travelled is the circumference of the gear. The little gear has to do more rotations to travel the same distance as the big gear. 
As they are interlocked, the two gears move together. You cannot rotate one without moving the other. And this results in the little gear always spinning faster than the big gear to try and keep up. So to recap, to slow down an input rotation, you go from a little gear on the input to a big gear on the output. And to speed up an input rotation, you go from a big gear on the input to a little gear on the output. And I can show you that by spinning the big wheel. Look how much faster the little wheel goes. Ha ha hang on though. We want our car to go as fast as possible, so surely this gear setup is the wrong way around. Well, if you're only thinking about speed, you'd be correct, but you don't get anything for free in physics. If we increase the input speed from input to output, we decrease the torque. Torque is a measure of rotational force. If we don't have enough torque at the output, our car won't be able to pull off the line and we'll just sit there with a very unhappy sounding motor. I can demonstrate torque by adding a weight to the gears. Imagine this load is the car. With the correct gear arrangement, although slower, the output is strong enough to push the car off the line. Or in this example, lift the load up. Because the big gear is, well, bigger, the little gear has more leverage at the point of contact with the big gear, so applies more force. Just like when you do a bolt up with an allen key, it's always easier to use the longer end of the allen key than the shorter end, and the longer the allen key is, the easier it is to do up the bolt. If I try to lift the load using the little gear, we should find that it's a lot harder to lift up. So here we go rotating on the big wheel, and oh no the handle broke because it requires so much more input torque and I cannot deliver enough force. Because I cannot deliver enough force at the input, the output will not rotate. And again, this is what would happen on your car. If you have the wrong gearing setup and not enough torque, you'll just sit at the starting line with the motor sounding really unhappy as it tries to get the car going. So there you have it. That is why we use gears. They help us alter the torque and speed and the gear setup on your car has been chosen to give you a good start. So what I'm doing now is lining up the two sprockets, so, and it's, this is before we've tightened our taper lock bush, bush. So I want to get those aligned so the edges of each sprocket come into alignment. It's a very fine adjustment. And now once I'm happy with that and keeping it in the same position, I can tighten the two grub screws in the taper lock bush and that will lock the taper lock bush and the sprocket to the axle. And these need to be done up fairly tight. So. Now we've got the axle sprocket aligned with the motor sprocket. Um, we've got to remember that um, whilst that's tightened up, we only gently tightened the grub screw on the motor sprocket. So now is the time to go back and fully tighten that. Don't forget to do that because otherwise your motor sprocket can slide on the shaft of the motor and cause your belt to fall off. And that should give us a belt that runs nice and true on both sprockets. We need to actually put some tension into that drive belt. If we don't tension it, what's going to happen? The belt's going to slip and damage the belt and not give you a good forward drive. So we need something to use as a lever. And in this case, I'm just using a, a large heavy duty screwdriver. And we can put it down through one of the slots at the back here, uh, either side down to the inside of the motor cage and then if I bring that handle towards the back of the car you'll see that the motor mounting plate slides further back. Now the next step I've got to do whilst that's in that position is tighten these bolts. Easy if you've got a helper. I haven't so here's a little trick. What I'm going to do is I'm going to feed a cable tie in through this hole here at the back over the top of the motor and then when it comes to the back of the, the other end of the motor cage, I should say, I'm going to bring it up through the slot, one of the slots where I have my screwdriver. With another cable tie to make it a bit longer, I can then close those in a loop. When I tension my motor plate with the screwdriver, I can actually then lock it in place with my cable tie. So again, lever on the plate with the screwdriver to 
pull it almost as hard as you can to the back of the car, then I can tighten up my cable tie as much as possible and that holds it in place. That means I should have good tension on my drive belt down here. Um, and I can actually feel for that by twisting the drive belt and it shouldn't be able to twist it by more than about 90 degrees. And that feels quite good at the moment. So the next step is now that that's held in place is to take our socket and ring spanner and tighten up the motor mounting plate bolts. And now with a pair of snips, I can actually cut my cable tie off and pull that out. And that's now nice and tight and all fixed, ready to drive. And that's the end of this video. If you need any further assistance with the Green Power project, please always feel free to email or call the office. We also have some brilliant community groups where teams share their experiences and expertise with each other. It's a wonderful place for collaboration, so don't miss out. All of the information you need is in the description down below. If you found this video helpful, please give it a like and maybe even a subscribe. Pretty please? Still, plenty of building left to be done, so I'll catch you on the next one.